Hey everyone, welcome to my uh, channel uh, and welcome to today's class on Certified Specialist of Wines 30 Day Study Sprint, Chapter 1, Wine Composition and Chemistry. Um, before I begin, let me start with a self-introduction and uh, explanation on why I decided to do this series of videos. So my name is Hans, I've been a enthusiastic wine drinker since I was 17 years old, which is, uh, uh, well, it's arguable whether that's within the legal age or not, uh, regardless of which country you're in. Uh, my formal wine education started in 2020 because I wanted to make something of my drinking habits during COVID. I do not work in the wine industry, although I have the WSET levels 2 and 3 certified in wines, and I'm currently working on my WSET diploma. Um, I thought about doing the Certified Specialist of Wines program in order to bridge the learning journey between the level three VSAT and the diploma level course. Uh, that's what I read on many websites on certifications. Uh, I was also considering doing the, you know, Certified Sommelier test instead but I don't really have a lot of interest serving wine to anyone but my friends and family. So <laughs> decided to skip that. Um, and I registered for the uh, CSW exam sometime late in 2021. And as we are speaking, it's in October 2022, and I've only got 30 days left to the exam, and I haven't done any studying. And the reason is that every time I open up the textbook, I find it really, really dull, because unlike the WSET, where you have uh, physical life classes with plenty of tastings and friends to do it with, the CSW only offers some online classes, barely any YouTube or online video content anywhere. And so I've decided that I need to create this series to motivate myself to study for the CSW and to help other folks who are studying for this, uh, who may face the same challenges as I do. Um, so without further ado, let's jump straight into the content. Uh, what are some of the exam questions you can expect that emerge out of the first chapter? Uh, questions could include things like, what are the first five uh, major components of wine? Um, what are the main types of drinkable alcohol found in wine? What's the most common acid found in both grapes and the wine? Tricky wording there, but uh, something to look out for. And things like what conditions can lead to a drop in what kind of acid. Um, let's dive deep into the content straight away. Um, the first question we got to ask ourselves is, what are the major components found in wine? Um, despite the strong taste of many wines, much of it is actually water. And that ranges from anything between 80 to 90% water is found in wine. Alcohol, which is mainly ethanol, it's only 10 to 15% of uh, most wines. Of course, you've got fortified wines, um, you know, then water is maybe 75%. And in certain sweet sparkling wines, you could get 90% water, but thereabouts is uh, the range here. Now, a large bit of it is actually acid. Uh, we'll cover different kinds of acid in a while, but uh, there's something to look out for. And then you've got sugar, which could range from 0 to 24%. And finally, phenolic compounds. So your phenolic compounds are those compounds that give the wine its you know, typical smell and flavor. So we'll cover that in a bit. So I mentioned alcohol just now. What kind of alcohol? It's mainly ethanol. Uh, I put the image of lab ethanol here, but uh, you don't make wine with lab ethanol. Uh, the ethanol produced in wine, it's by uh, what I call suicidal yeast, because what happens is that when you add yeast to grape juice, and the yeast will then consume the sugars found in grape juice, and it will output carbon dioxide and ethanol. And when it reaches a certain percentage of ethanol, it really depends on the breed of yeast you have, then the yeast will actually cause themselves to die because the ethanol kills them. So it's a pretty suicidal one-way journey for yeast, really. Uh, ethanol is really volatile. 
and it causes intoxication. Yes, I mean, that's why we're drinking. And uh, can evaporate very easily. And that actually helps to carry the wine's aroma to your nose. High levels of alcohol actually results in a heavier weight sensation on tongue. Now, this has always been a little bit counterintuitive to me because uh, I think we all learn in high school chemistry that uh, ethanol is lighter than water. But when it's on your tongue, it actually creates, when you drink it, when you sip it, it actually creates the physical sensation of weight. However, you know, alcohol and ethanol, they're not the only contributors to that sensation of weight. Sugar can also lead to this, even if the alcohol levels are really, really low. Now, this part is going to be a bit dry, uh, but really important, which is uh, acids in wine. And there are a lot of kinds of acids, and these all come out as exam questions. The really most important ones are tartaric acid. Um, it's the most prevalent form of acid found in both grapes and wine. That means that in the grape itself, you'll find a lot of tartaric acid. It's also got the strongest pH, and we'll cover pH in a while, but really that's a measure of acidity. So if you ever seen crystals in highly acidic wines like Tokai from Hungary, it's actually tartrate crystals. These are not glass. I don't know, like people are saying that, oh, is there glass in my wine? Is that I have never heard anybody ask me that question before, but it's often mentioned in textbooks that people confuse these uh, crystals that you find in the bottom of certain white wines to be glass, but no, they are tartaric acid crystals due to very high levels of acid. The next most common acid is malic acid, derived from melon, which is really Greek for apples. And guess what? It's found in apples. It gives grapes the distinctive green apple flavor and notes. For example, and the, this acid really starts to drop as the grapes start to ripen. But in uh, grapes that are done in a style that's not particularly ripe, for example, Sancerre, which has been a soft block, but actually also New Zealand soft block. Because uh, in New Zealand, what they do is that even though it's slightly warmer than the French region of Sancerre, but they actually harvest earlier in order to preserve that crisp green apple uh, flavor, which comes from malic acid. So the interesting thing about malic acid is that it can be converted to lactic acid during malolactic fermentation. And we'll cover this in a, in, in a while as well. Uh, next up, we've got citric acid, which is a kind of acid that's found in citrus fruits like oranges, and uh, only minute amounts can be found naturally in grapes. Uh, it could theoretically be added to boost acidity, but I am not aware of any winery that does this. Usually, the, when you do acidification, you would add tartaric acid. So anyway, uh, and for good reasons, really, because citric acid tastes very orangey. And um, you don't want your wines tasting like orange juice. And um, I just want to note that uh, this should not be confused with orange wine, which has nothing to do with oranges. Um, next up, we have lactic acid, which is an interesting one because it's not naturally found in grapes at all. It's formed when malic acid is converted into lactic acid via uh, malolactic fermentation, also known as MLF. Uh, lactic acid sounds like lactose, that's because it's related. Uh, it's really the same kind of acid found in dairy products like uh, your yogurts. So it creates this creamy mouthfeel and flavor. So think like Californian Chardonnay, right? really buttery, and smooth, that's, and instead of that lean and crisp notes you get from a French Chardonnay, for example. Um, so riper, more aromatic white wines tend to avoid the MLF process because if you were to do lots of melodic fermentation on a crisp sunset, it would no longer taste crisp. And uh, you will get this milky, buttery note where what you want is green and lean and, and, and nice fruit-forward aromas. That will start to fade when you start using MLF. Just to note on that. Uh, next acid is acetic acid. Basically, it's table vinegar, right? You know how it smells, really pungent. Um, 
some bit of it is produced by fermentation because ethanol actually converts into acetic acid, but two high levels of this could be caused by a harmful bacterium called acetobacter, making wine taste like vinegar. Uh, finally, we have the succinic acid, which is just a minor component in grapes. Uh, part of the syllabus, unfortunately, is a byproduct of fermentation. Now, here we go slightly more technical into acidity. Uh, when we talk about acidity in wines, we often use the term total acidity, TA, which is really total volume of acid in wine. Uh, there's also pH, which is uh, short really for power hydrogen. It's a logarithmic scale, and if you're like me, completely forgotten about high school math, uh, it's really just a fancy way of, of saying for every point increase in pH, the wine is 10 times more acidic. So, you know, let's say uh, pH 1 and pH 2, pH 1 is 10 times more acidic than uh, pH 2. So wine is typically between 2.9 to 3.9 pH. Uh, just for comparison, table vinegar is 2.5 in pH and water is 7 thereabouts. So the lower the pH, the more acidic it is. So when we say low pH means ac acidic. If we say high pH means less acidic, that's what we mean. Now, wines also contain sugars, as we mentioned just now, and wine grapes can be very, very sweet, around 15 to 28% sugar, and this is typically higher than what you get in your store-bought table grapes. Uh, I, the type of sugar that's mainly found in grapes are glucose and fructose. Uh, both are what we call monosaccharides. I've reproduced the chemical uh, diagram just right next here, and... Um, and these are known as simple sugars. Uh, yeast will ferment these to dryness. When we say dryness, it just means to no sugar. However, fermentation could actually be stopped, and that could produce off-dry, which means a little bit sweet, medium sweet or sweet wines. Uh, and these sugars, as I mentioned earlier, can add a lot of mouthfeel to the wine. Next up, we have the phenols, which are really where it gets exciting. Uh, you know, we have anthocyanins, which are compounds that gives red wine its color. Uh, higher acid wines, which again, low pH, produces wine with more red colors, while lower acid wines appear bluish. So when you see a wine that's almost purplish, um, it could be just because it's uh, lower in acidity. Uh, anthocyanins, very important. Please take note of that. And flavanols are the yellow pigment found in white wines. These increases in grapes that are more exposed to sunlight. That is one reason why California Chardonnay often appears to be a deeper shade of yellow than your Chablis from France. Uh, and then tannins. Yes, it's the same chemicals as used in tanning leather. They are the extringent, bitter compounds that are found in skins, seeds, and stems of grapes, and can be also found in oak. Uh, they're also kind of preservative, allowing wines to age. It creates a drying texture in the mouth. Often, non-wine drinkers may call tannic wines to be dry, even though they contain some residue of sugar. Like, this is where sometimes wine terms are not necessarily very, you know, intuitive or common. Like, I think a lot of us, when we first drink wine and we say, oh, it's got a drying sensation, it's a dry wine, we really mean tannins. But in the wine industry, dry means... Uh, not sweet. So that's just uh, something I find a bit amusing. Now, second part of phenols, the slightly less important phenols, but still important for the syllabus, is uh, vanillin, which is an aromatic compound found in oak, producing that kind of iconic vanilla scent in those very oaky wines. It's also the same compound found in vanilla beans, therefore the name. Uh, resveratrol is, I mean, sounds a bit like a drug, Maybe it is, I don't know, but it's deemed, it's also found in wine and is deemed to have health benefits for the heart. Uh, this is one of the questions that kind of comes up for the exam. These phenols tend to polymerize and basically it means join up together, forming longer chains. And when you've got these molecules becoming bigger, they get heavier and they precipitate in the wine, forming sediments. So we've all had wines where there's a whole chunk of dark, blackish sediments at the bottom, and that's really the polymerization of these phenols. But what's funny is that after you age it even further, these polymers could then break apart and reintegrate into the wine. 
So it's not a one-way street. So it's pretty funny. So aging wine is really quite a complex process that is still being researched upon and uh, better understood. And there's some other compounds found in wines, for example, sulfites. You might want to ask, why do I have a picture of bacon right here? That's because it's just a very controversial point, right? Like a lot of people say that they are allergic to sulfites, which is true, but um, it really depends on whether they've really gotten a health check and are they really allergic to sulfites or do they personally believe they are because they have a headache after drinking wine, which could just be a hangover. Um, I mentioned bacon because bacon contains so much more sulfites than wine. Uh, sulfites in wine is often, it's, it's a natural byproduct of winemaking, but also added in small quantities. So basically even natural wines contain some sulfur because of the byproduct of winemaking. It's not necessarily added sulfur. And the amount of uh, sulfur added is typically around 5 ppm, which is parts per million, to 200 parts per million. Uh, and as a preservative, it stops the wine from spoiling. Uh, and bacon is around 800. And so, you know, something to think about. In the US, wines more than 10 sulfites parts per million need to contain a health warning. That's uh, where you see the back of the label and you see may contain sulfites. Uh, that's the reason for that. It's a legal requirement. Um, some other compounds they can find in wine will be uh, aldehydes. Uh, these are occurs when you know, like um, oxidized alcohol exposed to air, creates, creating that kind of oxidative quality in wine. Particularly some types of sherry and Madeira, which are intentionally done in that style. Um, then you've got esters. It's an aromatic compound. It's found formed rather, sorry, when acids are combined with alcohol. And at lower concentrations, uh, ethyl acetate, which is the most common ester formed between acetic acid and ethanol. I don't think you need to remember that, uh, but just esters in general, it's when acids are combined with alcohols. They smell fruits and flowers, but at higher concentrations, it smells like nail polish remover and or glue. Uh, where I often like to draw the contrast is between your esters versus your phenols will smell more like spices, uh, while um, your esters will smell more like fruits and flowers. Just an uh, easy rule of thumb to remember. There's also a bit of dissolved gases, uh, mainly carbon dioxide, which is uh, what produces the bubbles in sparkling wine. And with that, we come to the end of the first chapter. Uh, I will see you in the next chapter uh, on the next video. Thank you for coming. And if you have any questions uh, or you spot any mistakes in my presentation, please feel free to reach out to me at this email address and subscribe to the channel for more videos on the Certified Specialist Wines uh, Study Sprint. Thank you.